Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I'd like, first of all, to tell you a little bit about why I wrote the Century Trilogy. After World Without End was published, I was very struck, very moved by readers' reaction to that book. Uh, not only did it sell a lot more copies than any of my previous books, but the way people talked to me about it was different. Uh, it seemed to be a more profound experience for people reading that book. And, um, of course, we authors like that. I mean, when people love the book, uh, we want that same experience again. So, I wanted to write another long historical novel, but I didn't want to write another medieval story. Uh, and so I thought, in the history of the human race, what is the most dramatic and interesting and dangerous period? And the answer is obvious, it's the 20th century. We had the First World War, which was the most terrible war that the human race had ever experienced, and then the Second World War, which was worse, and then we had the Cold War, which, if it had ever turned into a hot war, would have wiped us all out. Both sides had enough nuclear weapons to kill us all. So, this was a tremendously dramatic period, historically. Now, I start with history, and I believe, as I said in the film, I believe that it's better never to violate history. But what I try to do is transform history into part of the lives of the fictional characters in the book. So the story of the 20th century is told in the trilogy through the lives of the five families, Russian, German, English, Welsh, and American. Um, you may say, why families? Characters in my books are nearly always part of a family. Of course, this isn't true of, of all novels. It's easy to think of very famous characters in novels who are loners, who have no family. Think of James Bond. He has no parents, no wife, no children, no brothers and sisters. He's completely on his own in the world. Uh, uh, he... he um, has a different girlfriend in every story, of course. Um, but for me, it's much better for a character to be part, part of a family, and this is why. For example, in, in uh, Edge of Eternity, Kinder der Freiheit, there comes a point where Rebecca, who's the main German character, tries to escape over the wall. Now, I want you to be worried about her. This is the miracle of literature, isn't it? Of course, you know that this is not a real person. You know that Rebecca is a character that I made up. Uh, and yet, when we read, we identify with these fictional people and we share their emotions. When the people in the story are sad, we're sad. A tear might come to our eyes. Uh, when the people in the story are in danger, we sit up in our seat as we're reading. We share their emotions and that's what we enjoy about the experience of reading novels is entering into the emotions of other people. Uh, and so I need you to be scared when Rebecca is about to escape across the Berlin Wall. And it helps me in that task if she's surrounded by people who love her and are worried about her. So her mother is thinking, I'm... I'm I'm afraid for her. Is she going to be all right? Is she going to be shot trying to escape? Her brother, Valley, is thinking, how is she going to do it? What's she going to do? How is she going to avoid the border guards? Everybody is worried, and my feeling is that that helps the reader to enter into those emotions of anxiety. Anxiety is very important, isn't it, when we're reading a novel? It makes us turn the pages. Oh my goodness, we have to read another page to make sure that the character is okay. So, that's why my characters are 
always a part of families. Uh, the history of the 20th century shows us some enormous changes, doesn't it? If we think about the beginning of Fall of Giants, before the First World War, life was so different for people. It's only a hundred years ago. Think of uh, the status of women a hundred years ago. The role of women in society. At the beginning of Fall of Giants, uh, two of the principal characters are suffragettes campaigning for votes for women. Today, the idea that women should not be allowed to vote would be considered absurd. But a hundred years ago, it was what almost everybody f thought. Uh, women were not intelligent enough, or, or, or they were too emotional, or they wouldn't be rational, or all these, all these excuses for preventing women voting. Think of, uh, think of the change in the lives of people with dark skin a hundred years ago. Uh, most people thought that dark-skinned people were not as smart as light-skinned people. Completely stupid idea, but almost everybody believed it. Think of how gay people were persecuted a hundred years ago, and how today gay marriages are celebrated and, and uh, with pictures in the newspaper and happy headlines. The changes in our lives have been enormous. So it's a, f an, it's a fascinating period to study and uh, to try and bring alive in a novel. Uh, the, the neat thing, as, as soon as I thought of telling the story of the 20th century in a novel, almost immediately I thought that it would be three novels. Um, it was quite difficult to fit it all into three novels. Um, and the novels divided up very neatly into the three wars. And then I had the idea of the three generations. And this is, I enjoyed this part, and I hope that readers enjoyed the fact that in each book you see a new generation of the three families. One of the most important things in life is how our children turn out, isn't it? If you ask people, what makes you happy? Some people might say, well, it's career or money or love or sex. But for many people, the most important thing in life is not your own happiness, it's your children's happiness. And if your children are happy and if their lives work out well, then you're content. So in the trilogy, in uh, the second book, Winter of the World, the principal characters are the children of the characters in the first book, Fall of Giants. And then with the new book, Kinder der Freiheit, Edge of Eternity. The characters are the grandchildren of the original protagonists. And uh, uh, so as well as seeing the lives of the characters, we see their children and grandchildren as the century progresses. Three generations. Um, it's uh, taken me seven years. I mentioned in the film that seven years wasn't quite enough. Um, I should have said nine years. Uh, but um, I didn't want to, I hate to change my plans, and I didn't want to disappoint people. Uh, and so I, if, if you're a writer, the only way you can produce more is to work longer hours. You can't write faster, because if, if I wrote faster, it wouldn't be so good. So uh, all you can do is work longer hours. So uh, I, I worked um, seven days a week for some of the last seven years, and quite long days. Uh, and. Um, it's a million words, it's about a million words in the three books, uh, which seems, when I look back, uh, it seems an enormous amount. When I started this project, I wasn't really sure that it could be done. I mean, nobody else has tried to write the story of an entire century in novel form. Actually, Shakespeare wrote the story of the 15th century in a series of eight plays. Uh, it, of course, it, it's not particularly reassuring to an author to know that the only person who's tried this before is William Shakespeare. That didn't give me any comfort whatsoever. But it did so happen that round about the time I was thinking about this trilogy, those eight Shakespeare plays that tell the story of the 15th century were shown in sequence over four days by the Royal Shakespeare Company in London in a theatre called The Roundhouse. 
So we had Thursday night, Richard II. Friday morning, Henry IV, part one. Friday afternoon, Henry IV, part two. Friday evening, Henry V. Saturday, we had Henry VI, parts one, two, and three. And then on Sunday afternoon, we had the great Richard III. Uh, and you might think that was too much Shakespeare. But in fact, it was a peak experience. Uh, and uh, in the end, it did show me that it was actually possible to tell the story of a whole century in fictional form, in the form of personal drama, in the form of parts of people's everyday lives. So um, that's the book, that's, that's the trilogy, that's why I wrote it and a little bit about how I wrote it. Um, uh, when I speak to audiences like this, I find that the part people enjoy most is when, they get a when the audience gets a chance to ask me questions. And we'll do that in a minute. First of all, I'd like to read you uh, a scene from Edge of Eternity. And what's happening in this scene, and this is, this is, I thought, since we've all been thinking and talking about the Berlin Wall all day, I thought I'd read you a scene that doesn't have anything to do with the Berlin Wall. So this takes place in Washington, D.C. There are two characters in this scene, George, uh, and Maria are both young aides in, in uh, Washington. Um, and George is in love with Maria, but she doesn't love him. She likes him. They're friends. But she is having a very intense love affair with somebody else. George doesn't know who. And one day she calls in sick, and uh, he thinks that's very unusual. Uh, and so he goes to her, to her apartment to make sure she's okay, and he discovers that the reason she's feeling unwell is that she's had an abortion. And uh, there then follows this scene. Does it hurt, he said. Yes, it hurts like hell. Should I call a doctor? It's not that bad. They told me to expect this. Do you have any aspirin? No. Why don't I step out and get you some? Would you? I hate to ask a man to run errands. This is the 60s, remember. It's okay. This is an emergency. There's a drugstore right on the corner of the block. George put down his cup and shrugged on his coat. Maria said, Could I ask you an even bigger favor? Sure. I need sanitary napkins. Do you think you could buy a box? He hesitated. A man buying sanitary napkins? She said, no, it's too much to ask. Forget it. Hell, what are they going to do, arrest me? The brand name is Kotex. George nodded. I'll be right back. His bravado did not last long. When he reached the drugstore, he felt stricken with embarrassment. He told himself to shape up. So it was uncomfortable. Men his age were risking their lives in the jungles of Vietnam. How bad could this be? The store had three self-service aisles and a counter. Aspirin was not displayed on the open shelves, but sold from the counter. To George's dismay, feminine sanitary products were the same. He picked up a cardboard container with six bottles of Coke. She was bleeding, so she needed fluids but he could not postpone the moment of mortification for long. He went up to the counter. The pharmacist was a middle-aged white woman. Just my luck, he thought. He put the Cokes on the counter and said, I need some aspirin, please. What size? We have small, medium, and large bottles. George was thrown. What if she asked him what size sanitary towels he wanted? Uh, large, I guess, he said. The pharmacist put a large bottle of aspirin on the counter. Anything else? A young woman shopper came and stood behind him, holding a wire basket containing cosmetics. She was obviously going to hear everything. Anything else? The pharmacist repeated. Come on, George, be a man, he thought. I need a box of sanitary napkins, he said. Kotex. The young woman behind him stifled a giggle. 
The pharmacist looked at him over her spectacles. Young man, are you doing this for a bet? No, ma'am, he said indignantly. They're for a lady who's too sick to come to the store. She looked him up and down, taking in the dark gray suit, the white shirt, the plain tie, and the folded white handkerchief in the breast pocket of the jacket. George dresses a little like me, by the way. <laughs> he was glad he did not look like a student involved in a jape. All right, I believe you, she said. She reached below the counter and picked up a box. George stared at it in horror. The word Kotex was printed on the side in large letters. Was he going to have to carry that out into the street? The pharmacist read his mind. I guess you'd like me to wrap this for you. Yes, please. <laughs> with quick, practiced movements, she wrapped the box in brown paper. Then she put it in a bag with the aspirin. George paid. The pharmacist gave him a hard look, then seemed to relent. I'm sorry I doubted you, she said. You must be a good friend to some girl. Thank you, he said, and he hurried out. <laughs> Thank you. Well, now it's your chance to ask me questions about this book, any of my other books, or anything else within reason. And, um, but please um, put your hand up and wave so that somebody can bring you the microphone so that your question will appear. And don't be shy. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the story uh, behind this massive book. And I wonder, how do you uh, maintain overview about all these characters and threats and um, events? Um, how do you, um, yeah, work in, in writing these? Uh, is there a wall in your house uh, plastered with notes or how do you keep track of all of this? Well, the main way is by planning in advance. So, with all my books, before I write chapter one, uh, I spend uh, quite a long time planning the book, um, between six months and a year. I start with the basic idea and then I ask myself questions. Who are these people? What happened before? What happened afterwards? In each scene, what, what are people hoping for? What are people afraid of? What are they surprised by? Uh, and at the end of this process, I have what I call an outline, which is a document of about 60 or 70 pages. It tells me what happens in every chapter and who the characters are. And then, uh, keeping track becomes quite simple. When I'm ready to start writing the book, I look at my outline and it says chapter one, and it tells me what happens in chapter one and who the characters are. And so I suppose it's a question of breaking the task down into simple manageable parts. Uh, I've, I've done this, I've planned books ever since Eye of the Needle, was, which was my first successful book, Die Nadel in German. And um, uh, it was my first successful book partly because I planned it. And I realized at that point uh, that this, this planning method was the method that suited me. I know with many of my friends say they know the beginning of the story and the end of the story, but they make up the middle as they go along. And that works for many writers, but it doesn't really work for me. Uh, and I think it's because in popular literature, there should never be any boring bits. There should never be, you know, we're, it's not like, we're not like 19th century writers. In the 19th century writers, you could spend 12 pages describing a house or something, and the readers would read it. Uh, but we don't have that uh, luxury in the 20th and 21st centuries. Uh, our readers expect the story to move along at a good pace. Uh, and so, in order to make sure that there's always something happening in the story that makes you think, oh my goodness, what now? What next? In order for that to happen, then I have to plan very carefully. So that's why I spend so much time on the, on the planning. And, uh, and when the book is this long, that's how I manage to keep it all under control. Let's have another question. 
Mr. Follett, all of your novels seem to have a plethora of historical detail, and most of it, as far as I can tell, seems to be very accurate. Now, that requires a lot of research. In fact, more research, I think, than one person alone could handle. So I'm, I assume you have sources or ways to find out things without going in, becoming a history professor for all of the different historical epochs. Could you explain to us, do you have a research staff, you have a set of experts for individual questions? Uh, how do you get it done? Um, I, um, well, I do use history professors, but not at the start. Uh, the initial research, I have to do myself, reading the books, looking at the maps, looking at old films, interviewing people, I have to do myself because nobody else would know exactly what it is I'm looking for. But you mentioned detail, and of course the, a novelist is always looking for that kind of telling detail. But it's very difficult for somebody who's, who's not a novelist or somebody who isn't the novelist to know exactly what to look for. So I do that initial work myself, and, and that's part of what I call the planning process. And it takes me, I mentioned before, six months to a year before I write chapter one. But when I've written the first draft, I then show that to a lot of people, including a large number of experts. So for Edge of Eternity, uh, I had experts on German history, Russian history, on the civil rights movement in the United States, and so on. And I, I pay these people because, and I pay them quite well, because I want them to take the job very seriously. You know, university professors, it, they have a slight tendency to regard something like a student essay and write comments like, are you sure this is true? And I have to say to them, no, of course I'm not sure. You're the history professor. You have to find out whether it's true or not. So, uh, and so that's why I make sure that, that it's a job that they take seriously. Now, as well as those experts, um, for Edge of Eternity, I had the first draft read by a number of people who lived through some of those events. Uh, I've, one of my consultants was a man who worked for Nixon in the White House and subsequently helped Richard Nixon write his memoirs, a man called Frank Gannon. Uh, I have a friend called Peter Asher who was a pop star in the 60s and he read it particularly with reference to the scenes uh, that are set in the music business. Um, and um, people, um, uh, there's a character in the story uh, who um, is having a love affair with President Kennedy, a woman is having a love affair with President Kennedy and, and people say to me, do you really know what President Kennedy did when he was in bed with a woman? And the answer is yes. <laughs> I do know. Uh, and the reason is uh, a woman called Mimi Alford, she was uh, 19 and working in the White House press office when President Kennedy seduced her. She had an affair with him over a, a period of a year uh, and then kept the secret for 50 years. And then uh, the Washington press corps found her and outed her. And she very sensibly, she, by now, she is now a very respectable old lady. She had a job working for her local church. And uh, so she very sensibly said, I'm not gonna ask, I'm not gonna answer re questions from newspaper reporters. I'm going to write a book and tell my story, which she did, it was published, I read it, and I got in touch with her and said, would you please be one of my consultants? for my book, Edge of Eternity, and she said yes. And so I sent her the first draft, and she made some corrections, and she gave me some additional information. <laughs> so I do, it, it's, I do have a team of experts. It's a different team for every book, uh, and that's the stage at which they come into the process. And they all send me reports, and I have their reports. I summarize their reports, and I, that's what I have in front of me when I'm doing the rewrite. I have another question. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Follett. My question is, if on such a great work of a century and uh, how to do or how you get around if you have an, if you have an uh, a break, a work, a disease for, for going on uh, with, your, with your novel, with your writing, your write blockade, 
some authors told that they have it and they are sitting at their room and don't know how to write on. So if you had it, have, what are you doing to get around? Something. Happily, I, I have, you're talking about the phenomenon they call writer's block. Yes, and t touch wood, it has never happened to me. Um, but, and, but I can imagine it. And what people say is that they sit, sit in front of the screen or in front of the typewriter with a piece of paper in it and they just don't know what to do next. And they know they're supposed to write something, but they can't think what they should write. And I suppose the reason it doesn't happen to me is that I, I never do that. I'm never sitting in front of a blank screen thinking, what shall I write next? Of course, there's, there's a moment when I'm thinking, what will my next book be about? And I try out various ideas, and then I begin to write the outline that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and so by the time I get to the stage where I have that piece of paper or that screen with chapter one at the top, uh, if I'm not sure what to write, I can look at the outline and say, okay, what's the first thing that happens? And then I can just say that. And I'm a great believer in, if you can't think of a flowery, vivid, terrific sentence, just write a plain sentence. You know, just, uh, if, you, if you can't think, um, I mean some, some, of, some of my beginnings are quite good. <coughs> the beginning of the Pillars of the Earth I'm very proud of. It says, the small boys came early to the hanging, which is very spooky. Uh, but sometimes I can't think of, of, of something like that. And On Wings of Eagles begins something like it all started on the 28th of January, which is a really dull beginning when you think about it. It's really <laughs> terrible, actually. Uh, but if you can't think of anything anything swanky, then just put a plain sentence. There's nothing wrong with plain sentences. Uh, so um, that phenomenon of writer's block has never happened to me. Even talking about it, I feel a little worried, you know, because I shouldn't, I shouldn't be too confident about this because, uh, you know, um, I don't believe in the gods, but um, the gods might say, he's too self-confident, let's hit him. <laughs> but so far, they've been kind. I have another, another question. Who's got the microphone? Hello. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask you if you would share with us how you got into writing. Um, I don't know anything about whether you always wanted to be an author or whether it just came to you one day. Um, my partner and I are both aspiring authors and in love with Pillars of the Earth and we share it all the time. So would love to know a bit more about that. Thank you. Okay. Um, after university, um, I got a job as a trainee newspaper reporter. And that was really more because I was interested in politics than because I was interested in writing. Um, but I, I had the impulse to write fiction because as a young newspaper reporter, in the evenings, um, I uh, would write short stories. And um, my first wife, Mary, bought me a typewriter at one stage for my birthday, and so uh, I didn't have to borrow somebody's typewriter so I could write my stories. But those short stories um, were never published. Uh, and the reason they were never published is that they were never good. Um, they j I used to send them off to magazines and get rejection slips. And then something happened. I, um, I had a financial crisis. My car broke down, and I couldn't afford to get it fixed. I needed 200 pounds to get the car fixed. It was a lot of money in the 70s. And uh, we had just moved to London. My daughter had just been born. We had just got a new house, big mortgage, broke. So I went to the bank and asked them to lend me 200 pounds to get my car fixed, and they said no. That was the bank. We had a, there was another reporter on the newspaper who'd written a thriller and got it published, and we were all very interested in this. We said to him, how did you find the time to write a whole novel, and how did you find a publisher, and how much money did you get? And he said, 200 pounds. <laughs> so I went home and said to, uh, my, to Mary, my first wife, I know how we're gonna get the car back. I'm gonna write a thriller. And she said, oh, good. <laughs> Anyway, I did. I wrote a thriller. It, I wrote it very quickly. Uh, I sent it to the same publisher who, that had published my colleague's thriller, 
and they liked it, and they gave me 200 pounds, and I got the car fixed. It wasn't very good. The book wasn't very good, and it didn't sell very well, um, but, but sort of well enough. And at that point, I thought, next time, if I write another book, perhaps, I can, perhaps it will be a bit better. And, you know, perhaps it will sell well. Um, and, but, and, it, and it didn't. The second book didn't sell particularly well either, but it was published. So I was very lucky in that those early efforts, which were not really very good, did actually get published. So at the end of the process, I had a real book that I could hold in my hand and a, a check for a small amount of money. So I was constantly encouraged. But I did think I would, I would go into the, a bookstore, as you do when you have a book published, you go into the you want to see it in the store, okay? So I'd go into the store, and at the front of the store, there would be a pile of books. This is the new title by Frederick Forsyth. And here, the new title by Sidney Sheldon, like a hundred copies. Uh, and my book was all the way at the back of the store, and there were two copies on the shelf. And so I, w I used to think, okay, what have I got to do? I can write a book, I can get it published. All I need now is to get it from the back of the store to the front. What do I have to do to do that? What is Frederick Forsyth doing that, I, that I'm not doing? What's so special about him and Sidney Sheldon? And so for, for some time I was writing, trying to write that bestseller and not, succeeded, not succeeding. And in fact, Eye of the Needle, which was my first success, was my 11th book. Uh, if, if those early efforts had not been published, I'm not sure that I would have had the perse perseverance to carry on with the process. So I, I'm very grateful to the, all, all those publishers who lost money publishing my early efforts for encouraging me. Um, and I'm glad some of them have, in the end, made some money out of me. Long answer to a short question. We have another question? Uh, hi, I just, w I just want to know uh, what your future projects are, or is it going to be a big surprise? No, I'm very happy to answer that question. I finished Edge of Eternity uh, almost a year ago, and since then I've been working on a new story. Uh, I wanted to write a story set in Kingsbridge, which is the town where, a fictional town where the Pillars of the Earth takes place, and World Without End. Uh, World Without End is 200 years later than the Pillars of the Earth, so I thought about another 200 years, which takes us to the 16th century. Quite an exciting period of history, it turns out. Uh, Queen Elizabeth I was on the throne of England, and a lot of people wanted to kill her. Many attempts at assassinating Queen Elizabeth I. So she set up the first English secret service. And so the story I'm working on is a story about spies and secret agents, but in the 16th century, uh, where everything is strangely similar to the world of espionage in the 20th century and the 21st century, except that everything takes much longer. That, um, that coded letter written by the spy in Paris actually takes 10 days to get to London instead of 10 nanoseconds. Uh, but in other respects, uh, it's strangely similar. So that's what I'm working on, and I've, um, uh, I've been working on the outline. I still have some more work to do. I've stopped working on it in order to come to Berlin and many other cities to talk about my new book. Uh, so I haven't done much work on it since August. Um, I'm going to be on the road until Christmas, but in the new year, I'm going to get back to work on it, and I hope it'll be published in 2017. I'm thinking of calling it A Column of Fire. Do you like that title or not? <laughs> if you don't like it, I'll change it. <laughs> you have another question? Is there a microphone? My name is Vasco. Um, my question is, is it going to be a thriller or is it going to be another of your historical romances that you are getting used to do in the last year? The new book? Yeah. It won't be a trilogy, no. It'll just be a single book. I, um, 
I've really enjoyed writing this trilogy, but I'm not sure I want every work to be a trilogy. I, it just, it, it'll be long, though. It'll be long. No, be, people, uh, you seem to like long books, and I guess, of course, if a long book is boring, it's terrible, isn't it? Because you, you start looking to see how many more pages you've got to read before you can get on to something else. But I think if a long book is exciting and interesting, we like it better because we want it. I do. If I'm really enjoying a book, I want it to carry on. I don't want, to, want, don't want it to be cut short. So, oh, well, my wife Barbara would like to ask a question. <laughs> she, um, you, you'd think she had plenty of other opportunities, wouldn't you? Actually, it's not a question, it's a correction. The gentleman asked you if you're going to write another thriller. Oh, thriller, not I thought trilogy. you said... trilogy. Thank you, I thought you said trilogy. Oh, okay. Th oh, thank you, darling. <laughs> well, I don't know, I'm not planning to write any more thrillers. I'm, I've really... I've really got into these long historical novels, and, and readers have too. But you should never say never. So who knows, one of these days I might think, wouldn't it be great to write a short novel about somebody who's trying to assassinate the president or something? Another question? We, we just learned that your, the motivation for your first book was 200 pounds. So I wonder what is uh, your <laughs> <coughs> what is the, what is your motivation nowadays to, to to go on? Good question. Um, well, I uh, I have learned how to spend money much more quickly than I used to. Um, but also, uh, you know, I. I sometimes imagine, what if I lived in a country where everybody was paid exactly the same regardless of what they did? I would still want to do this, and I would still want to write stories that pleased millions of people, because, uh, you know, it's the, it's the biggest kick of all to, to, to do something artistic uh, and to feel good about what you're doing and then to have the world say, yes, that's great. I mean, there's, that actually, that's worth more than money. I, and don't make, make no mistake, I like making a lot of money. I'm not pretending, I don't pretend to be a monk or anything. I, that, all that pleases me. But the feeling, that, that feeling that the work that you've produced uh, is loved by millions of people is the best thing of all. And, and that's what, if I ever get discouraged, which doesn't happen very often, but if I ever feel I tell you what sometimes happens. I write something, and it's okay. And the next morning I read it, and I think, well, it's not very good, but it, maybe it'll do. Maybe it's good enough. And then I think about you and all the other people who are looking forward to my next book. And I think, yeah, they deserve something better than this. And that's when I, I tear it up and and write it again. That's, that's when, so what motivates me at that moment, what motivates me is the thought of the people who are looking forward to this book. And the worst thing I could possibly do, the greatest sin I could commit would be to disappoint those people by being a little bit lazy. So I try never to be lazy. That's my motivation. Have another one? Hello there. Um, I was wondering if you would like to see your um, characters and your stories on a screen, in a movie or a TV series, to reach an even wider audience with um, the story, because I think it's a great way to tell the history of the 20th century. Thank you. Well, um, I too like to see my stories told in movies and in television series. Uh, it's, of course, authors worry about this, because you give your book to a film producer or a television producer, and you know he's going to change it. They have to change it, because they tell stories in pictures, and I tell stories in words, and it's a different art form. But the author worries about this. I've been very careful to make sure that the story is logical, it makes sense, there are no impossible things in it, and no boring bits, and I worry that the film producer may not be as careful as I am. On the other hand, it's a thrill to see good actors up on the screen playing the characters that I invented and 
saying the lines that I wrote. It's a big thrill. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I like this, and um, we've sold the rights to Sony, uh, and they are developing the, the, the trilogy as a television series, along with ABC, the American network. So we have some, we have some big players in this. The producer is Mike DeLuca, who made a film called um, The Social Network, uh, and another film called Captain Phillips, which I thought was a wonderful film. And, and Mike DeLuca wants to do something for television now. Many cinema, distinguished uh, movie people are working in television nowadays. And so he's producing this, and a well-known Hollywood scriptwriter called Anne Peacock is writing the script right now. We, and they hope that they might have a pilot ready for February 20, 2016. So 15 months from now, they're hoping. So that's the, that's the story. Now, if I said to you it's definitely going to happen, you would know I was lying, wouldn't you? Because in Hollywood, things can fall apart in a day. So, but I, I have high hopes, so keep your fingers crossed. And we have time for one more question. Is a, is a lady waving very hard right in the front. Okay, thank you. Finally, I got the microphone. <laughs> and um, I would, uh, to let you know something, um, I'm blind, and uh, you read the um, book on an uh, iPad, and I would like to let you know that um, since I got my um, iPhone one and a half year ago, I could read your books too. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. And um, I would like to ask you if you could sign the last book I could read with my eyes. Of course. <laughs> of course, I would be very glad to. <laughs> well, Thank you very much. Well, th and thanks, uh, thanks everybody for your questions, which have been really interesting. I like this, I like the question and answer part of the, of the session because I also get to hear you speak and I get to understand some of the things that you're thinking about my books and this is very interesting to me. So thanks everybody and I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. <laughs>